good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. I just want to speak about uh, the ultrasound of the breast and more particularly about the uh, ultra high frequency we use nowadays in uh, breast imaging. And I thank the company for uh, having me here. So, we heard this recently in the news that uh, from Airbus that despite fantastic technology, the big is not always the most appropriate solution for every problem. So, particularly for the young radiologists, uh, I don't think you don't have to let you blind only by the big machines, by MRR. We have now fantastic, very small machines that are very capable and clinically very valuable. And these are the new ultrasound machines. So, uh, and moreover, it's, uh, it's environmental friendly. It uh, does not consume a lot of electricity. We are not pouring gadolinium in the environment. Uh, we're not uh, using contrast media, x-rays. So it's a very green technology with a lot of future, I think. And there is recent, in recent years a tremendous technological evolution in ultrasound. So one of the things is the use of ultra-high frequencies of over 20 megahertz, but also other techniques like matrix transducers and other things I will discuss a little bit uh, in the presentation now. I think with this, all these improvements, we have an improved spatial and contrast resolution, artifact reduction, we have additional uh, ultrasound technique, so I think we have a quantum leap now in small pores imaging since uh, recent years and since a new generation of machines. As you all know, an image is a combination of spatial and contrast resolution, and that's very important in breast, for example. Mammography has a very high spatial resolution to see the microcalcifications uh, more particular. Uh, but it has a very low contrast resolution. On the other hand, ultrasound has a very high contrast resolution and comes up nowadays with the high frequencies to the same or even better spatial resolution of below 100 micron. If you look at an ultrasound image, it's a slice. And the slice has a certain thickness and uh, certain characteristics. You have the axial resolution. Actual resolution is mainly dictated by the frequency. So the, uh, the higher the frequency, the smaller the wavelength, uh, the better your resolution. So that's an improvement of the high, uh, uh, ultra-high frequencies. Uh, second thing is the lateral resolution, depending on a lot of things, uh, also on the probe and on the technology behind. But you have also a third factor is the slice thickness or the elevational resolution. And it's very important. It's depending on the probe technology and also on the um, the construction of the probe and the machine. So what we want in high resolution ultrasound is thin slices with an even thickness from top to bottom with a high axial and lateral resolution, with a low noise image and at a high frame rate. That's the ideal uh, situation. And now with the new transducers, we have broadband multi-frequency, ultra high frequency transducers. And this opens really a new world, not only in breast imaging. We have frequencies going up to 24 and now on the boot you will see up to 33 megahertz. We have uh, a large bandwidth transducer so that we, with two probes we can cover from 5 to 24 megahertz uh, frequencies with only two probes. And that's uh, very interesting for a lot of applications and also, of course, for breast imaging. If you have a, a transducer and you, you slice it apart and you see that it is the, the crystal element that's in the linear probe, it's, a, it's a, an array with several uh, crystals in, in one line. And depending on the characteristics, that depends a little bit your resolution. But with the new 1.5D or matrix transducers, you have several rows of crystals that makes it possible to focalize in the elevation plane. That means in the plane perpendicular on the slice plane. And this gives you a much more precise beam and a much thinner slice thickness. And this is very important because Ultrasound image is not just a virtual slice, it has a certain thickness, it has a certain shape. Where in a normal linear transducer you have like this shape, it's always the, the thinnest slice at the level of the focal point. But with this several rows of crystals you can focalize in different directions, not only in the um, plane of the image but also in the elevational plane. So you can uh, have a very fine um, slice with a very even thickness from top to bottom. And that is very important in breast imaging, for example, because we have, we all know the partial volume effect. 
if you want to see very tiny structures in the breast, it's very important, like the microcalcifications. If they are much smaller than the slice thickness, you won't see them. You, you need a very slice, thin slice thickness to, see, to, res, to have the resolution of the very small lesions. And in breast, this is important. And th this is as important as the higher frequency uh, because this dictates mainly the axial resolution, but the slice thickness is also very important to resolve these small things. I give you one example. You see the breast density with some microcalcifications. It's very easy to see this microcalcification. You see the tumoral lesion, you see the ductal extension with the microcalcification. It's very easy to see. The influence of the focus is very important on a standard probe because this different shape of slice thickness. And here an example of a small uh, calcified oil kiss. If the focus is okay, then we see it very well. If the focus is much lower, then you don't see it anymore because of the thickness of the slice, the partial volume effect. So this is not only, uh, quality is not only linked on the frequency alone, it is also linked in the probe technology. And this is what we have now with the, the, the matrix 1.5D. Uh, that's a 24 megahertz probe here. We use it at 20 megahertz. You have a small cyst and the focus is okay, but if the focus is very low, you still see very well the lesion. That's important. You have a, an even uh, slice thickness, uh, which is less focus dependent than in a normal probe. And where it's very important also is for guiding the precision of your biopsy. If you have a very small breast cancer, two by four millimeter, you see your needle here and you think your needle is inside the lesion and you have a correct sampling. If you look in transverse section, you see that you just go alongside the lesion and that you miss the lesion because of the slice thickness. You, s you see in this thick slice, you see the lesion and the needle at the same place. So it has the impression that it's in the lesion and it's not true. And with the very thin slices, it's at first hand a little bit more difficult to, to go for your guidance be because it's, it's a thinner slice. You more rapidly you, you lose uh, your needle or the, the vision of your needle. But on the other hand, it's much more precise. If you see your lesion and your needle, then you're absolutely sure that you're in the same plane. And that is quite important. And I have an example here. Uh, from a metastatic lymph node. You see there's only two millimeter cortical thickening. So we have to sample this asymmetric cortical thickening. And you see the tip of the needle very nicely on the right spot. And here you see a fine line, and that's the passage of your 21 gauge fine needle through the pathological area of this lymph node. And you see here with an 18 gauge a biopsy, you clearly see that you have correctly uh, biopsied this uh, lymph node. So for this small uh, things, it's slice thickness is very important. And the overall quality, slice thickness, contrast resolution, allows us to have a very good anatomical view of the tissue structures of the breast. We see the normal ductulolobular structures. This is a duct, this is the reflective line, is the lumen of the duct, and this is the wall of the duct. This is a resolution of a couple of hundred <laughs> microns. We see the terminal ductulolobular units, and where on mammography we don't see anything. We see just the density of the gland, that's all. Dynamic range of the image is also very important. If you have a low dynamic range, you have a very black and white uh, image and you don't see and desist what is happening. And with a higher dynamic range, you have much more subtle tissue differences, not only in a cyst, but also in uh, solid lesion. You will see a lot of blue images in my presentation. We use it for a long time already because um, our eye is more sensitive for contrast differences in the blue range, the shorter wavelength, and therefore we use this blue. And you can improve the, the contrast uh, detection without changing the dynamic range. So that's an advantage. And here we have a lesion on the mammography. You see calcification. You see them perfectly well on your ultrasound image. And with another specialized technique, the MicroPure, you highlight this in blue and you see this area of microcalcifications very well, even better than on mammography. So that shows the resolution, not only contrast, but also spatial resolution of uh, the modern ultrasound imaging. Harmonic imaging is also a very important technique that we use as a standard now. 
It's like, like looking through your window without uh, a mosquito net, and you have a much clearer image with l much less artifacts. And harmonic waves are generated by the asymmetric response of tissue on the, the push-pull um, ultrasound mechanical wave. So we use the second harmonic, uh, which is a double of the send frequency. If you send 5 megahertz, you get back signals at 10 megahertz. And that's what we are going to use. What is the advantage of it? They have a much smaller beam, uh, the harmonics. So we have an increased lateral resolution in our image. So higher frequencies, better resolution, uh, harmonics, better uh, lateral resolution of the image. And on the other hand, we have an improved contrast resolution because we get rid of side lobe speckle noise and things like this, reverberations. They are situated on the fundamental frequencies and they are filtered away with our system. But therefore, we need a large bandwidth transducer that can cope with all these different frequencies because if you have a sand frequency of a certain frequency, the double uh, the second harmonic has the double of frequency, so the uh, probe must be able to cope with these differences of frequency and must also have a very high sensitivity because the intensity of the signals is lower than the echoes from the fundamental uh, signals. And to improve all this, I will not go into detail, but uh, we have now Pulsion version uh, harmonic imaging. So we have two pulses which are each other's mirror imaging. And by adding the, the returning signal, we can have a better uh, signal because we get rid of the artifacts, which are, uh, if you add these two signals, the artifacts are from the linear responders, so they have the same frequency, we can cancel them out, and we can add the harmonic signals, which are asymmetric, so we have a better signal. And to improve this for superficial and for deep at the same time, we do a technique with uh, two, two times two pulses for the more deeper, uh, we get a better penetration and a better resolution in the superficial. That's the result of this pulse inversion differential harmonic imaging. What we now do standard in, in breast imaging is, of course, this high resolution B mode imaging, but also other techniques, very sensitive uh, Doppler and spectral Doppler, and also elastography. We call this a multi parametric approach that you will see also for other applications uh, in abdomen and things like that. We have now new Doppler techniques, microvascular images. We are very sensitive because with normal techniques, we filter away the clutter, which is uh, caused by the movement artifacts of the vessels with our low, uh, lower frequencies. So we filter that away. So by doing that, we don't see low velocity, low intensity flow in small vessels. But with this technology, we can, with a special algorithm, we can see it. We see very well, with a very high sensitivity, these low velocity, low intensity signals. And you have here a comparative image. This is standard machine on a standard color Doppler with a low uh, range, so high sensitivity for low flow at four frames per second. We don't see anything flow in the breast lesion, this breast cancer. If you look at this with SMI, we are at 49 frames per second. Hmm. We see very good the vascularity of the tumoral lesion, and we have at the same time a better resolution of the B mode image. It's not so degraded, so there are a lot of advantages on this <coughs> technique also. And this is an example of a breast cyst that's, that's inflamed. You have this wall thickening, and when you put this sensitive color doppler, you see that the wall is very highly vascularized due to the inflammation of the cyst. And we also see very good in malignant tumors, the irregular vascularity of a tumor, which is typical, these irregular penetrating vessels in a malignant tumor. And this at 21 megahertz, 28 frames per second. So that's real time, really. Typical benign vascularization for a fibroadenoma is typical flow around the lesion and less inside the lesion. So you have like a basket-like uh, vascular structures around the lesion because this lesion uh, displaces the normal um, structures. And what we can do also is very, have very sensitive spectral Doppler. And if we look inside the lesions, we always have a low resistance index for uh, benign lesions with a high diastolic flow. In 
malignant lesions, we always have a higher resistance index. This lesion looks relatively regular. Here we have some calcifications, micro calcifications, you can see clearly, and we have a much higher resistance uh, index inside the tumor, usually above 0 0.80. So that's because it's a harder tissue. There is an increased resistance or impedance in the vascular bed, and this gives you this a high resolution. So this can help also to differentiate between benign and malignant lesions. This is a malignant tumor, and you see just outside the tumor, you have a low resistance flow. Inside the tumor, you have a high resistance flow, even with di diastolic. It's very typical in most cases of malignant lesions. So we use this as an extra parameter next to the B-mode imaging, of course. And where it's extremely important is when you look for introductal structures like papillomas. You have a, a duct of one millimeter here. Here's the nipple area, and there is something inside. It can be debris, or is it debris? Uh, dense uh, 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 protein-rich material, or is it something solid? And with this very sensitive technique, we can show that in this small lesion, introductally, there is clear vascularization. So that's typical for a papillary lesion. Another technique we use is uh, elastography, and this measures the stiffness of uh, the tissue. There's something falling out, so the presentation is not complete. So we measure by ultrasound the stiffness of the tissue. And we have two techniques, strain and shear wave. Uh, strain is not quantifiable. Shear wave uh, is a more quantifiable method that we also use in liver, for example. And we, you, we measure the, the compression, the stiffness of the lesion. Usually a malignant lesion is much harder than a benign lesion. This is a nodule and see it's in this case more red, which means from this scale it's much harder. And uh, there's an extra element to say this is a malignant lesion. This is what we get with a shear wave elastography. It's more precise and it's quantifiable also. This is a four millimeter lesion. You clearly see it on the image and you clearly see that it's a very hard lesion, so this malignant sign, where a benign lesion like a fibroadenoma is a soft lesion and it has low values on elastography. That means it's here in the blue scale and uh, we have not this uh, very high stiffness characteristics. So we have a very nice toolbox now to have some very good uh, diagnostic performance. We have a very high tissue resolution uh, so that means we have a higher sensitivity in detecting lesions, smaller lesions. We have a more specific image because we can see, look at different characteristics. And this is very important for interductal pathology, also biopsy guidance, lymph node staging and others. And that's a typical example. We have a very small nodule here, four millimeter, it's hypoechoic. It's a soft lesion because it's blue. It's very highly vascularized with a flow with low resistance and that's typical for a papilloma. A papilloma has always a low resistance flow and as compared to its size, it's relatively highly vascularized. So we all know that there is enough clinical evidence nowadays, I think, to say that ultrasound is, is accurate. And certainly in symptomatic patients, we all know that's for more than 20 years, where studies show that it's the first choice technique for palpable lesions, of course. And you have other very large studies, like the Kolb study, where you see that in very dense breast, you detect only 55% of the cancers. So you miss 48% of the invasive cancers. And with the combination of both, you miss only 2%. And then we talk about the study of maybe 10 or more years ago. So with the improved quality, this is certainly the case nowadays. And why is screening mammography not good in dense breast in C and D? Because it's like looking for a, a polar bear in a snowstorm. We won't find it. You have no contrast resolution in, in uh, mammography. So which, in my opinion, we should impose to an additional ultrasound in virus C and D at least. Otherwise, we deny patients a chance of an earlier detection and a better cure. And how many people have dense breast? According to a study from Stanford University, that's 50% of the patients are C and D by that classification. So that means one women in two. And in California, it's an obligation to tell to the patient that they have dense breast, that they have a higher risk. Not only they have a lower detection rate, but they have also a higher chance of breast cancer. And that's why we 
miss one in five cancers in a, in a standard uh, uh, screening setup with mammography alone. And here is one example. You have a very dense breast. You see nothing on mammography. Here we see a very irregular lesion, four to five centimeters with microcalcification we don't even detect here. Uh, we see them here, and you see this typical vascularization. This is not normal. So this was a very complex lesion, papillomatosis, ADH, but also DCIS and three foci of invasive carcinoma completely undetected on mammography. And even in, in dense fatty breasts, we often find uh, also additional lesions that are not seen. You see this nodular lesion, but there is a little bit like a tail, and it's the ductal component. So that it is a lesion with a ductal extension. It's only one or one and a half millimeters, so that proved to be a high-grade DCIS. So actually we have with it high frequency, high end ultrasound technology, we have a very detailed insight in the tissue, art in the histological tissue architecture with a far better contrast resolution and at least equal spatial resolution of mammography. So we have a lot of studies nowadays, the ABUS studies, 57% more detection of cancers, 93% invasive cancers, which is very important. Also this study, you see the difference, mammography alone, in dense breast or this. These are already older studies. Patients with high risk, 55% more cancers if we add ultrasound. So if you have this overview and see these thousands of patients in, in screening settings, where we detect three to four extra cancers per thousand women, where the normal detection rate is about five to, to seven. So these three to four extras mean more than around 50%. So we should do more ultrasound, I think. And why is ultrasound so good? We, because we have a good insight in normal anatomy of the breast. We perfectly see the skin, the, the corpus ligaments, the, the, the glandular tissue itself with really the architecture of the glandular tissue. And we all know that the breast the tissue aspect density and distribution is depending on age and physiological status. This is a completely fatty breast, and you see here the fibrous envelope of the breast. This is fat, this is also fat, but it's different inside the glandular envelope than in the subcutaneous fat. And we will easily see also on ultrasound lesions. And you see what kind of uh, histological image you get on a high-frequency ultrasound now. You not only see a white thing, you see really all the canals, the different collectophoric canals, and you see differences in dense glandular tissue, it's more hypoechoic adenosis or in young patients or in lactation. So we are closing in a little bit on the pathologist uh, with the, the resolution. And that's the, the actual resolution we have now as a standard. We have 70 micron resolution with the 24 megahertz. And you, you see a normal, I'm sorry, I have to go back. Uh, you see a normal galactophoric duct, you see the lumen, it's 150 microns. The, the wall of the duct, the epithelium, the mere epithelium is less than 150 microns and this at 27 frames per second. So we have a very detailed histological insight of the structure of the breast. Talking about intraductal lesions, I think ultra-high frequency is probably the best technique we have nowadays for detection and characterization of these kind of pathologies, uh, intraductal pathologies. You can see perfectly normal uh, galactophoric uh, ducts uh, less than half a millimeter diameter. You clearly see this because you have a very good slice thickness and high frequency. You have ductectasia, that's very frequent in older patients, and frequently you see in these ducts, you see reflective material uh, protein-rich, uh, fat-rich material, but this is not uh, solid uh, things. Uh, and this is a different image than, for example, in uh, ductal hyperplasia, where you see that the wall is thickened and you clearly see the lumen this of the duct, which is normal and regular lined. <coughs> Sorry. When you look for papillomas, usually because of the fluid production, you have a solitary dilated duct with something inside, a structure that we can resolve very much. So to be sure what's inside, we need a very high sensitive Doppler. Here we have a, a localized uh, reflective structure inside the dilated duct. Is this a solid lesion or is this something else? The Doppler system now is so sensitive that we see very good vascular structures even in the wall 
uh, and around the ducts and we see no flow in the ductal structure. So this is simply a dense um, amorphous material in the duct. And it's different if you have a papillary lesion. You can clearly show the high vascularity. So this is very important. It's a papilloma of six, seven millimeters. And even smaller ones, two, three millimeters, we can perfectly see because of the resolution of the, the new probes and the high sensitivity it clearly shows us the vascularity. So we're quite sure. And we can also do intervention and take it away with a vacuum biopsy. And you clearly see the striking resemblance between the pathology image and the ultrasound image. A dilated duct, you see the pedicle, the papilloma, and you see the vascular pedicle here with the vascular structure. And this really is the same as what the pathologist sees, but more in detail. Papilloma can calcify. I mean, we can see calcifications of the mammogram, and we can go to the ultrasound and see that's an interductal lesion that is partially calcified. And this can be a sclerosing papilloma, but can also be a DCIS. Here we also have some calcifications. We have a small calcified lesion introductorily, and we have some dense material in the duct. And we see that there is a high vascularity in the wall of the duct. So because of the inflammation, there is a periductal mastitis combined with a calcified papilloma. Inflammation gives you low resistance flow, a tumor gives you high resistance flow. Papilloma itself, low resistance flow. In this mammogram, we see some density here around the nipple. It's not a lot of difference, but with the ultrasound, we see that the, the duct is enlarged behind the nipple and we have clear vascularity. This is a DCIS, a completely solid DCIS without calcifications. So it's important if you see this, this thickening of this duct that you can say this is a solid tissue lesion or it's just some uh, material, dense material. And papillomas are usually very small, two to five millimeters. But despite their volume, we can detect very high vascularity in comparison to their volume. These are two and five millimeter lesions. They can also occur intrakistically for millimeter here. We see partially fluid. So this is an intrakistic papilloma. This is not a simple cyst with some debris. We can show the vascularity. We can show the low resistance flow which is highly suggestive for a papillary lesion. Another example of an intrakistic papilloma, if you see this on mammogram, you say this is a density by that stew because it's very regular, just follow up, no. With ultrasound, you see there is a something inside. And if this something inside is highly vascular and you have a fluid level, which is hemorrhagic fluid in this case, it's very likely that it's a papillary carcinoma because you, then you get hemorrhagic fluid. So as we all know, uh, well, in breast imaging, palpable lumps are a very important uh, daily clinical reality, but not all, luckily, not all uh, palpable lesions are a cancer. We also have the task to reassure the patient if they feel something that we can say what it is. And lipoma is a typical example. The patient palpates a lump in the breast, which is not seen on the mammogram, but there is a lesion, and that's a papilloma. We can reassure the patient just with ultrasound. Hamartoma is a bit similar. It's a fibroadenolipoma. Depending on the degree of lipomatous and adenomatous tissue, it has another aspect. We can maybe uh, see it here, but clearly see it that it is a well circumscribed lesion that is mainly fat and some adenomatous tissue and breast. Post traumatic changes can cause uh, palpable uh, abnormalities in the subcutaneous fat. You, it, it becomes harder, and you have an hyperreflective area with small cysts, um, which are caused by small bleedings and fat necrosis. And this is a typical image. Don't need anything more than um, just an ultrasound to say, okay, that's a typical post traumatic change in the subcutaneous fat. We have to deal with a lot of cystic lesions, of course, in palpable lesions. And uh, a cyst occurs when a galactophoric duct is blocked and there is a dilatation of the lobule. Sometimes it's more multilocular. It's really a lobular dilatation, like a grape. Easy to see, of course, on ultrasound. Don't need anything else. And they come, the cysts come in all shapes and sizes, small, large. Uh, they are clinically important. But the importance is uh, to see if there's nothing inside. And sometimes you have apocrine cysts and you have secretions um, in the cyst that can transform over time. And it's usually a combination of fatty and protein-rich content. And you see that you get 
the small droplets are fat, and the rest is, uh, let's say, dried out, protein-rich content. And this is not a solid lesion. This is a simple assist with transformation of the uh, intracystic uh, secretions. And if you think there is a cyst, it's very important to have a high-resolution image. If you have a cyst that is completely filled with dense, fatty and protein-rich material, it looks like a solid lesion. But with high resolution, we clearly see that there is a wall around the lesion, and that is typical for a cyst. This is not a solid lesion. This does not have this configuration, so we can reassure the patient without doing anything else than ultrasound. And some cysts can be very dense because of hemorrhagic content, and it can be very dense on, uh, on mammography. And a lot of cysts, you will see there is a little level and a small crescent with fluid, and that's pathognomonic for, for a cyst with a dense content, and we can be absolutely sure of that. If you have an inflamed cyst, you will see that the wall of the cyst is thickening, and there is some infiltration, some edema around the cyst. So all these things we can see with ultrasound, and we don't see this with mammography. Intrakistic papilloma, another example here, confirmed with MRI. It was not... Uh, the other way around, we first do the ultrasound. And that's a patient with multiple cysts, but one of the cysts has a thickened wall, so we are worried and we do the large biopsy and that proved to be an adenoid cystic carcinoma. So be careful with cysts, always look good at the wall, the content of the cyst, there can be something inside the cyst. With this modern high frequency, we can also have a good image on skin and subcutis, and maybe this 33 megahertz is now coming on the market. This is an opportunity to see even more dermatologic or skin-related problems. We have epidermal inclusions. Is the patient feels a little lump, feels a little lump, and you can perfectly see that's situated intradermal, and it's an epidermal inclusion cyst. A typical image is a sebaceous cyst. It's the, the canal of the cyst is blocked, and you see like an apple-like configuration. You see the canal in the skin. This is a pathognomonic image for a sebaceous cyst. This is not a tumor. And this cyst can, can rupture and cause absidation. So this is the content of this sebaceous cyst, but around you see some other fluid. This is pus, and there is edema around, and you see this very high vascularity around the lesion. So this is the inflammation that shows on this, uh, on this image. This is 18 uh, megahertz image. But be aware also that small cancers can mimic this image. And you have here a small cancer that is growing into the skin. You clearly see it's growing into the skin. And this is a solid lesion because it's very highly vascularized. This was an invasive ductal carcinoma. Fat necrosis and inflammation. Uh, and, and sometimes you see MR controls, a patient who had a breast cancer on the other side, and there was a small enhancing area uh, here on the MRI. And it's very important to do second look ultrasound. And with this high frequency, 24 megahertz, we see this is a small cyst, one millimeter with clear edema around. So this is fat necrosis with inflammation. This was histologically proven afterwards. We see, of course, a lot of benign lesions in the breast. We all know fibroadenoma, oval-shaped, uh, regular lined, hyperechoic, uh, with uh, capsule or with poor vascularity. This is a standard image, but you see what detail, it's the logical detail we see nowadays with these high resolutions. We see the pseudocapsule, which is the compressed tissue around. Uh, we have a slit-like uh, compressed glandular structures inside the lesion. We have the typical morphology of the uh, the vascularity that I explained to you already, and we have the high resistance flow, so we're perfectly sure that this is a fibroadenoma. And we all know that older fibroadenomas can calcify. We can also see this. We not only see the calcification, but we see that it's a nodule that is calcified. Below this looks a little bit like a fibroadenoma. It's usually more hyperechoic because of the higher cellularity. It's probably more lobulated in some cases. There is some desmoplastic reaction around the hyperechoic area. So um, we can a little bit differentiate, but anyway, if you see this, you have to biopsy it anyway. Most important, of course, in breast imaging is that we detect malignant lesions. And uh, as you all know, 90% of the cancers present as calcifications or mass or both, and the most frequent are invasive ductal or non-special non type. Uh, followed by DCIS and invasive Flodiburg carcinoma, which are a little bit more difficult, and 10% uh, have a rather 
abnormal ultrasound presentation because of the type of tumor. Typical tumor, very irregular, hyperechoic, uh, stellate, uh, and distortion of the normal architecture. Um, you have um, uh, desmoplastic erection, you know, that is very typical. But the, the behavior of such a lesion depends also on the histological structure, the cellularity of the system, the lesion. You can have very high attenuation when it's very fibrous. You have very irregular uh, structure, spicular structure with desmoplastic reaction, the hyperechoic wall. But the lesion can also be more rounded and have no reinforcement or shadow. And sometimes you have an acoustic reinforcement. We sometimes see this in fast-growing lesion where there is central necrosis and uh, there is a factor of inflammation also. So we can also give an, an idea of the, the histological structure of the lesion and it can be very different. It can be rounded disruption of normal architecture, irregular lesions with necrotic areas, desmoplastic reaction, only shadowing, no mass, isoreflective lesions like mucinous carcinoma, spicular disruption. So we have all kinds of uh, images and most of the time these lesions have a very much higher vascularity compared to the size in comparison to a fiber adenoma, for example. And even in dense breast, where we don't detect the lesion, we can see this clearly. But now with a multi-parametric approach, we have a very high resolution image where we see the architectural structure of the lesion. We see the borders, we see ductal extension, we see desmoplastic reaction, but we also see the vascularity. We can measure the type of vascularity, the resistive index. We see that it's a heart lesion. So all this together gives us a more confident uh, ultrasound diagnosis of breast cancer. And if you have a fast-growing lesion, you can have central necrosis. And you see the center is more reflective than the periphery. And it's only the periphery who is vascularized. So this is all central necrosis because of the fast growth. So it's important to know this if you do a biopsy, that they do this in the viable part and not in the necrotic part of the lesion. Using as carcinomas can very, be very tricky, and they are frequently isoreflective with the surrounding fat, and sometimes difficult to to detect on ultrasound. You see a distortion here, and you see a nodular lesion, which is highly vascularized, so it's mucinous carcinoma. Be careful with solitary, localized fibrocystic areas. Frequently, they contain other pathologies, like in this case. You should say this is a multicystic uh, area, but there is a mucinous carcinoma inside. So for this kind of lesions, we do ultrasound-guided large vacuum biopsies. Very small lesions below 5 mm, 3 mm, they can easily be visualized with, uh, with ultrasound. That's not a problem with this high frequency uh, imaging, 21 megahertz. And when we don't detect things on the mammography because of the poor contrast resolution, we really see the structure of a normal breast tissue. And here we see an enlargement of the duct. You see this fine white line? This is the compressed lumen of the duct with irregular thickness and here is a lobular extension of tumoral tissue. So this was ADH combined with areas of DCIS with a lobular growth pattern. This looks like real histology under the microscope and you see this vascularity as an extra element in the diagnosis. If you have a well-differentiated, uh, more slowly growing uh, tumor, you get more distortion and you get more small stellate lesion, which is hard to see in a standard mammogram. We can see it on the tomosynthesis and here on ultrasound, it's not a problem. To see this distortion, we see that it's a solid lesion, all these vessels pointing towards this lesion and it's harder than normal tissue. So we have all the elements to say this is a malignant lesion. And the degree of differentiation, the speed of growth, will, will dictate a little bit the image we get. This is a fast-growing tumor. It pushes away the normal structures. It has a poor differentiation, central necrosis. This is a slower-growing, better differentiated uh, tumor, which has more stellate aspect. So you can al already have an idea or a clue in what direction it goes uh, concerning the differentiation degree of the, of the tumor. This was something that was missed on a screening mammography because they thought this was just an asymmetric uh, um, 
glandular area, but on tomocytosis you see that it's a long stretching lobulated thing. It was um, branching like this. It was very highly vascularized, so very suspicious was also an adenocystic carcinoma. And some cancers like lobular carcinomas give only subtle abnormalities and give only attenuation. This patient has a small cyst, but the area around was a lot of attenuation, which is not normal. That's not caused by the cyst or by any inflammation. It's just caused by an invasive lobular carcinoma, which was afterwards confirmed on the, on the MRI. And here you have only attenuation. That's always very suspicious because of the growth type of the invasive lobular carcinoma. You have this Indian file uh, growth pattern with fibrosis, and it gives no real mass in some cases. And then you only have attenuation. You have to look very careful with ultrasound, but you can see it. Most common presentation of ductal carcinoma in situ is, of course, uh, we detect them by the calcifications on the mammogram. And when you see calcifications, you do an ultrasound to see if there is an associated mass, and this is quite frequent. Malignant calcifications are better visualized because of the surrounded hypoechoic tissue. In the breast, you have a better contrast. And can we see microcalcifications? Yes, we can, from more than 20 years already. And now, certainly, with this with these newer probes, it's absolutely no problem. You have, this is already an older image uh, of the 500 series, you have a tumor with calcifications. You see the enlarged ducts with the central necrosis calcifications. Absolutely no problem to see it. That's what we have today. It's at, at 17 megahertz. You see the duct. This is an enlargement. It's less than one half millimeter. You see the dilated duct, irregular in shape. This hypoechoic area is, are the tumor cells. This is the central necrosis. It's a little bit more reflective than the rest. And you have this microcalcification. So this is a typical image. It's really what the pathologist see under his microscope. And what we detect here for the calcification, but we can see them also. And this is a transverse section of it. It's exactly the same as the pathology. You have the enlarged duct tumor cell central microcalcification. So this is a really striking resemblance between the high resolution ultrasound image and the pathology. I can show you many examples. You have an area of calcifications here, five millimeter. You see them clearly, but you see also that there's a little bit ductal extension. This is typical for a ductal carcinoma in situ, histologically proven. And to differentiate, it's important to see this calcification and also the location of this calcification. In fibrocystic changes, you have sometimes microcalcifications that are situated inside a cyst, and you can clearly show them that it's not tumor because it's in this uh, dense uh, content of this kist in fibrocystic changes. So this helps also differentiating between benign and malignant lesions. And this is the typical image we see now with uh, in situ carcinoma. It's a hyperechoic and large dutch so, so filled with solid cell material and central calcification. That's a typical, typical image. We can clearly see this on ultrasound. And moreover, if we, in this hyperechoic filling of this dilated duct, we see not only the calcifications, but we see vascularity. That is an argument in favor of in situ carcinoma. So we, now we are able to see vascularity in an in situ carcinoma. Intraductal in situ carcinoma. This is in <coughs> pardon. another example. You have a, a duct with central debris and calcifications. These are the tumor cells, and you clearly see the vascularization of this duct. It's less than two millimeters. And you see the striking resemblance with the pathology image. It's exactly the same image we are seeing. So we can go very far in the differential diagnosis and also in detection of the lesion. Of course, larger areas of microcalcifications, we, we can clearly see like a starry sky at night. But we have also non-calcifying DCIS, where we have only ductal wall thickening, but no calcifications. And if you look at this patient, the left and the right breast, there's an area where the ducts are much larger than on the other side and more irregular. And this was confirmed by the MRI, but also by vacuum biopsy to be a large area of non-calcified DCIS grade 3. So that's important to detect. They always say that ultrasound is less good to, to estimate the size and the extension of a tumor 
but with these new capabilities, we see not only the invasive lesion, but we see also the ductal extension with the microcalcification. So we have a better idea of the total uh, length, of the total size of the tumor, which is for very important information, of course. And DCIS, we know, is often associated with the mass. So if we see a mass, we also look around. We have some very faint calcifications here. In and we see this irregular enlarged ducts up to several centimeters from the, the tumor lesion, and we see this fine microcalcification. So we can tell to the surgeon this lesion is more extended than you, at first sight you would think. And this is the invasive component, but there is also a large uh, component of uh, in ductal carcinoma. We can use it in postoperative, of course. We, we can see easily scars, uh, we can see fat necrosis is very frequent and it changes over time. So there's a, a special type of, of imaging. But what is important uh, to this patient's follow-up is detect eventual local recurrences. They are always invasive. And so we look at solid areas, sometimes with calcifications and with abnormal vascularity. So there also ultrasound is quite important, um, uh, quite important too. Also for implants, we can very easily see the, the implant. We can see the tissue, overlying tissue. We can even look behind if you want. We have a very high detail of this uh, envelope of these modern uh, multi-layer uh, breast implants, and we see perfectly the overlying tissue. We see all kinds of complications. We see the fibrous capsule formation better than on any other technique. Uh, we see calcifications of the capsule, we see ruptures, the linguine sign or the stepladder sign if you want. Intercapsular rupture, you have a mixture of oil and fluid, you get the oil and vinegar image. That's all very difficult. We can see all these, calcifi all these complications very easily. Also, extracapsular leakage of silicone. This gives you the well-known uh, snowstorm image that you can see also in lymph nodes if the silicone is already in the lymph nodes. So that's very easy to detect on ultrasound. That's a very typical image. Also, we are perfectly able to see the overlying tissue and eventual tumoral lesions or benign lesions. So in my, my experience, my uh, opinion, routine MRI for breast implants is absolutely not necessary. It's, it's done in most centers, but it's absolutely not necessary. You can, with ultrasound, see equally good everything you want to see. You see if the implant is intact, you see all kinds of complications, you see all kinds of lumps, this is absolutely no problem. And you can also do guided biopsies safely if you want. Although you have only three millimeters, for example, you can do a fine needle, but we don't do this uh, very often. And, and for med core biopsy, there is always a chance the needle throws forward, we can penetrate uh, and, and rupture the capsule of the implant. So that's not the purpose. Uh, so that's why we prefer for, for a suspicious lesion in the breast with breast implants. We, we prefer the bigger vacuum-assisted biopsy needle. We prepare the, the situation by injecting local anesthesia. We can go for a very reliable biopsy, a very small lesion, without this forward throw of the needle. And we can perfectly safely uh, do correct biopsy or retrieve benign lesions that bothers the patient so without uh, touching the um, implant. And this with a very large needle, so without any uh, problem. So ultrasound is the number one modality for all kinds of interventional uh, procedures, be it localization, biopsy, fine needle, vacuum biopsy, whatever you want. 90% of the biopsies are done ultrasound guided. And you can perfectly see in a core biopsy where you have biopsy, you see really where you have taken the sample. There's a little tunnel in the surrounding tissue, but also in the lesion. You can prove that your sample is adequately into the tumor and you see the passage of the needle. And for vacuum biopsy, where you go for these tiny lesions like uh, papillomas, which are benign, but they have clinical problems, they can uh, degrade over time. So we take them away with vacuum biopsy needles. So the more precise your image quality, the better you can do these very uh, nice procedures. And also for microcalcifications, we see them more and more. 
The standard procedures for micros is, of course, a vacuum biopsy stereotactic guided. We, we do with this quality of ultrasound imaging, we do more and more ultrasound guided. And certainly, when the calcifications are located in difficult areas, it's only seen on one projection here. So that means it's quite lateral to the thoracic wall. And we have only one centimeter here. And we have this area of the carcinoma in situ. Remember, hypoechoic and large ducts with central calcifications. We can perfectly localize them. And we have a much better control. And in areas where stereotactic procedure is difficult, uh, close to the skin, to the nipple, to the pectoralis, axillary tail, small breast, we go for ultrasound guided uh, vacuum biopsies rather than stereotactic biopsies. Another last point is, of course, the staging. If you detect a cancer, it's the lymph node staging. We all know the localization of the different uh, lymph nodes. And you, you know the anatomy of the lymph node. You see the vascularity of the lymph node. But what's important is the cortex. We know that the lymphatic drainage towards the lymph node is from the periphery to the center. So we have to look at the periphery of a lymph node to see if there is tumor involvement. A normal lymph node, and certainly in elderly patients, is less than one millimeter cortex. If this is thickened or there is some bulging or there is some asymmetric thickening, uh, this is uh, suspicious uh, for lymph node involvement. And then we have precisely to biopsy the areas who are suspicious. And we have a lot of different presentations of this kind of lymph node in, in very different locations, mammary antenna, rotor space, axillary, inframammary lymph node. And we can perfectly see that with ultrasound, and I think better than with any other modality. So to do a good uh, ultrasound exam for breast and lymph nodes for staging, that we need absolutely very good spatial resolution, contrast resolution, very high Doppler sensitivity, very slight thickness. These are the key elements to obtain this kind of quality where we have a very confident di diagnosis. And uh, I'm convinced that with this improved ultrasound technology, we have a lot better spatial and contrast resolution. And we have a much higher contrast resolution on mammal, better assessment of lesion vascularity. Uh, we have a more sensitive, specific imaging te technology. We have a very good differentiation possibility due to multiparametric approach for malignant and benign. It's superior for introductal lesions, staging lymph nodes. It's a very efficient and clinically very valuable technique, which is also uh, uh, cheap and is not completely innocuous. So I thank you for your attention. <laughs>